Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Sometimes we are uneasy, O oh God, even though we hesitate to confess that we have sinned, we know for certain that not all we have done is our very best. Much of the good we could have accomplished was forgotten. We have often allowed our worst impulses to control us. We covered our shame with excuses that give us some kind of comfort. So forgive us in our self-deception and open the true meaning of our actions to our own scrutiny. So God, let us find the deep joy of forgiveness in turning our lives back to you. In this day, with suffering near to us and close, help us to see the kind of compassion that Jesus gave and let it be reflected in us. But do not let it stop with only those who are near. Help us understand the true sense of being neighbors to all of humankind, as Jesus is. And then show us how we may be instruments of comfort and uplift and peace for the sick and the hungry and the cold and the homeless of the world. Make our hands do your work, the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our model and our Lord. This day which dawns cold and crisp is a gift of your love. Each morning, new light enlightens the day with the glory of creation. And even in some of the frightening turns of nature, we can find beauty. Whether it is spring or autumn, summer or winter, we realize your gift of this earth in all its majesty and power. But more than that, you have given us the true life and the true light by your word made flesh among us. In him we find glory and meaning and purpose. In him we look into the face of your love. And so we thank you and praise you forever. God on earth and God in heaven. Amen. If you will join me for the invocation prayer in unison. O oh God, oh God, sweep the cobwebs from our minds as to your issue. Unblock our ears so we may hear your word. Inspire us so that we may become your true disciples and serve you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down scripture this morning. She said, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'm reading from uh, Mark, the first chapter. Um, before I read it, I, I want to let you know that the um, other scriptures that are referred to in the bulletin are referred to parallels to this in Matthew, Luke, and John. Um, John is quite different in that John does have Jesus walking along the the shore of the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Genereset, um, as it should be called. It's not a sea, it's a lake. Um, and, um, and as he walks along the shore, he encounters first uh, Andrew and Peter, and then he encounters James and John, and there's a crowd in, in uh, the Gospel of John talks about a crowd being there, and Jesus asks John and James to borrow their boat so he can go out onto the water and preach to the crowd. And in John it says that he did, and you know why he goes out on the water? Anybody have any idea? Think about there was no electronics in those days, so there's no microphone. He could be heard by the crowd. So he goes out on the lake where the surface of the water echoes his voice back to the people so they can hear better. They knew about that stuff. <laughs> Jesus knew about it. And anyway, so that's, that's the story that John tells us. And then later on, John says, um, so uh, how, how did your night of fishing go? Because they fished at night. Um, I, they used, I don't know if they used torches like they do in some parts of the world um, to attract the fish so they can catch them. But, but uh, J James and John said, oh, we didn't catch anything. He said, now put your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch some, and he got one. So that's kind of the context in which Mark, um, by the way, Mark is the first gospel that was written down John was much later, so I sometimes wonder if John's story got added to the actual incident from another time, but it doesn't matter. It's there nevertheless. So I'm going to read to you Mark, and um, we'll go with Mark pretty much for my message. Jesus begins his work. After John was arrested, now we're talking about John the Baptist. After John was arrested, 
Jesus went to Galilee and told the good news that comes from God. He said, the time has come. God's kingdom will soon be here. Turn back to God and believe the good news. Then the next section is entitled, Jesus Chooses Four Fishermen. As Jesus was walking along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. They were fishermen and were casting their nets into the, into the lake. Jesus said to them, follow me. I will teach you how to bring in people instead of fish. Right then, the two brothers dropped their nets and went with him. Jesus walked on and soon saw James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in a boat mending their nets. At once Jesus asked them to come with him. They left their father in the boat with the hired workers and went with him. Let us pray. O oh God, open us up to the different ways you come to us. And even though we don't fish for a living, we know you do come to us and call us to follow you. You're not limited by our preconceptions of God. So open us up to all possibilities. Amen. I believe that Andrew and Peter, Simon, as he was called, um, Jesus renamed him Peter. Andrew and Simon and James and John were good Jewish men. They were faithful in their practice. They uh, wanted to do right. They understood the Ten Commandments and the implications of those Ten Laws. They lived good lives. Um, Andrew and Peter made a fairly good living fishing from the Sea of Galilee, from Lake Genereset. So did uh, James and John, along with their father. They made a good living. Um, and they had families, and they took good care of them. They contributed to the economy of the towns around them, and particularly of, of uh, I can't even remember the name of the town. Is that not Caesarea? It's, um, anyway, Capernaum, that's what I'm trying to say. You remember, didn't you? Capernaum? Yeah, okay. Um, they contributed to Capernaum and the other towns around the, that part of the of the lake, um, and they were probably well respected because people could rely on them uh, to get enough fish to purchase for their families. So they had a decent living. They were good people. They were they weren't rich, but they weren't poor either. Um, and yet there were people who lived in and around Jerusalem, who would have looked at Andrew and Peter and James and John, looked down their noses at them and said, you're beneath us, you're not good enough, you're not holy enough. Because the folks who lived in and around Jerusalem, not all of them, but many of them, felt that they had a better handle on the faith, the Jewish faith, because they had the benefit of the temple. They could go to the temple anytime they wanted to, and they did. They went often, and they gave offerings in the temple. And they thought that they had a handle on what God really wanted of the people. And so they kind of lorded it over the people from those, those hicks from up in Galilee, those hicks who lived around the lake, those hicks who lived up in the, in, in the hills up there. They were, they weren't practicing the faith the way they should have. They thought, they somehow thought that perhaps uh, 
we're, we're, we're better, we understand the scriptures better, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we have our, our fingers on the pulse of God. And so the people up in Galilee were kind of second class, as far as the Jewish faith is concerned. They were not appreciated for who they really were. But these ones that had been keeping the faith, and I put uh, air quotes around keeping the faith, um, these ones from Jerusalem, the, the, the priests and the Sadducees, not the Pharisees so much, because the Pharisees were everywhere. They were in Jerusalem, but they were also, there were numbers and numbers of them up in Galilee. But the priests and the Sadducees, um, had kind of gotten their own system going and they were corrupt. They, they made deals under the table or maybe sometimes not under the table. They made deals with the Roman conquerors, the Roman uh, oppressors of them. They made deals um, and uh, you know, they had the ear of the, uh, the guy who was in charge, the governor, the Roman governor. And you know, later on, you know who that governor was, don't you? Anybody know? Come on, somebody know. Pontius Pilate, okay? Pontius Pilate. But they, they had the ear of the governor, and they could suggest things to him, to, and they'd say, oh, this this will keep, this will keep the people happy, you know. So they had this nice little deal with the oppressors to keep them uh, in a better position with the, with the oppressors. And their, their, their practices in the temple um, weren't always of the highest standard ethically. I'll put it that way. And then along comes Jesus, and Jesus has a, a real deep understanding of the scriptures. He knows the law really well. It's not that Andrew and, and Peter and James and John didn't know it. They, they knew it, but Jesus really understood it. He understood the implications of those things that we call the laws those religious laws that the Jewish people were supposed to follow. Jesus understood that. And, and Jesus made a connection with people because he cared about them, each one, individually. You know, it's not like the Sadducees and the priests knew, knew everybody, but it was almost as if Jesus knew each individual on a very deep and personal level. And this Jesus kind of upset them, upset these these people in charge who had 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 their their hands on the legacy, if you will. And Jesus comes along, he gets crowds to follow him, and he does things that make them feel, oh, they matter to God. They're important enough. For God to care about them. And he comes and calls Andrew and, and Peter and James and John. And they, they respond to him. Jesus does have a certain charisma. But he also has a way to really get to the heart of the person. And they understood the genuine care and love that Jesus had for them. Well, the people already had a hunger for, for what was to come. They wanted change. They didn't like the, the Roman overlords and they thought uh, somehow the, the, the priests and the Sadducees had a way that might make their lives easier. 
take some of the taxes away, for instance, and, and uh, give them some kind of control over their own lives rather than having the Roman occupation control them. So Jesus comes along and the reaction of these four fishermen seems kind of natural if you think about it. Um, their, their reaction was not an intellectual reaction. It wasn't uh, like the wise men who came to Jesus. If you remember, Epiphany took place about two weeks ago and uh, the wise men came to visit Jesus as an infant, remember? They came because of their knowledge. They came because they had studied the scriptures and they used that knowledge to discern that this was where this promised one was to come. They came because of their knowledge, but these fishermen followed Jesus because of their emotions. They were really drawn to him. Their hearts were moved by him. And they followed him. This was a drastic change to their lives, their livelihoods, their families. And yet, they were able to make it happen. Now, where am I in my, my message here? So, this is not a casual decision on, on their part. Even though it, it seems instantaneous as we read it in the scripture, it wasn't casual. They, they probably had heard about this Jesus because the word of Jesus had come, come around like wildfire had spread across Galilee because Jesus had made such a difference in the lives of so many people already. And so they saw him and they recognized that this was the one, the one whom they should follow. So they followed because their hearts were pulled, their emotions, their, 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 their sense of what was right not because they were so smart, but because they were so open. They were emotionally open to Jesus. A number of years ago, it's been 17 years now, um, I, had, I decided that my friend, the Reverend J. Willard Cofield, some of you know who he is, um, needed to learn how to swim. He had never learned as a child how to swim. Um, there were those who thought they had, you know, they had attempted to uh, help him learn how to swim, but, but uh, Willard, Will, Willard said, no, I, I, I don't know, and I don't think I ever will learn how to swim. I said, well, we were members of the Y in Springfield at that point. They had a swimming pool. You, you see, the, the, the Y here in Westfield is better off than Springfield at this point because you do have a pool here, I, I believe, and uh, Springfield doesn't anymore. But anyway, back then, Springfield did. And, uh, and Willard and I went to, the, uh, went to the swimming pool at the Y on a regular basis, uh, twice a week. And we would get in, and I would just try to help him get comfortable with the water in the shallow end. Now, you know, I mean, how many of you know how to swim here? Raise your hand. Is there anybody who doesn't? Okay, a couple of you don't, okay. Let, 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 me, uh, let me suggest that most of you know this, and those of you who don't know this, listen carefully, okay? You know that when you get into the shallow end, it's relatively safe, isn't it? You can touch the bottom, and at the beginning, you can hold on to the side, right? And you can just get comfortable with the water. And if you're there and you keep going, and maybe sometimes you'll, you'll learn how to dip your head under the water and not feel panicked by that. Well, that's what I did with Willard. And we eventually got to the point 
where he could hold on to a paddle board, you know, those, the styrofoam paddle boards and paddle with his feet and paddle across the, you know, the, the, short, the short way of the pool, across <laughs> from one side to the other in the shallow end. And he knew he was safe because he could always stand up and be safe, okay? Well, after a while he got so he could get a little deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper. And um, he finally had enough courage to try some of the classes in swimming. And so with my help and the classes and other coaches he had, over a, a several years, I, it took at least three years, but he got so he could swim all the way the length of the pool and back again without a paddleboard. <laughs> without a paddleboard. You see, he, would, he learned how to do it because he took it in little tiny steps. And I think we can learn almost anything if we take it in little tiny steps. The trick is to be patient enough, right? We need to be patient to do that. And, um, you know, I, don't, I haven't swum in oh, 10 years now, maybe, but I used to love to even go under the water. And you know that as you, you, when you learn to swim, you learn to coordinate your breathing and your strokes so that you can, you don't breathe in the water. You know, when you're swimming the crawl, you take a breath when your head is above the water, when your mouth is above the water. Um, but you can also learn how to control your breathing so that you can go underwater. And that is where I just love to be, or I used to anyway. I love to swim underwater. Now, granted, you can only be there as long as your breath, as long as you can hold your breath, unless you have scuba gear, gear on. But I just <coughs> love that because there under the water, you feel weightless and it's a fascinating. There's no other, there's no sounds coming it's quiet and you can just kind of go as long as you can hold your breath. Willard learned to jump in, even in the deep end. And I'm so proud of him for that. So glad I had a little hand in that. Um, well, Peter, and your brother Andrew, James and John, they jumped in in the deep end, didn't they? They jumped in in the deep end. And I, I, I know if we talk about actually swimming, they didn't know how to do it. It was interesting that the fishermen didn't know how, how to swim. And I, I found that in Gloucester, the fishermen there don't know how to swim because they, it's too cold. If you, fall in, you're going to drown anyway. So why learn how to swim? Don't ask me. Don't ask me why, uh, how they come to that conclusion. But anyway, um, they didn't know how to swim. So swimming, of course, is a metaphor for what they did. But they jumped in the deep end. And they became leaders in the church that eventually formed after Jesus died and was raised. They became leaders because they were able to allow their heart to move them to action. The wise men used their intellect. They used their heart. And they were able to follow Jesus and make a difference. So they became, again, this is a metaphor, they became fishers of men and women. And there's a little song, it's, I think it's printed in your, in your bulletin if you look. It's a song most of you have learned as kids. I will make you fishers of men. Shall we try that? I will make 
said she didn't know it, but then when she learned it, she said, oh, I remember this when I was little. <laughs> what about us? Do we have an attraction to Jesus that makes us let go of some of the stuff that holds us back? I invite you to let go and to jump in and become those who fish for people. <clears throat> Let us pray. Well, Lord, open us up. Open us to the different ways you come to us, whether it's by the seashore or at work or at home or in school. Let us open up to you and push us to respond to your call that we may jump in. Amen. We're going to have some more service music now, some things you can sing along with. Please stand if you're able to.
Worship His 
not a beautiful piece. It's love. So don't forget. You're called by God to follow him, follow Jesus. So I invite you to jump in, whether it's in the shallow end or the deep end, and learn to swim in this spiritual world, in the spiritual calling, the calling that calls us to invite fellow human beings into following Jesus. God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you in that calling. To God be the power and the glory forever and ever.